Hello and welcome to part two of our series on Gerdel's incompleteness theorem. Last time we looked at how a series of symbols and typographical rules can be freely interchanged with a series of numbers and rules using only arithmetic. The system we're going to be taking a look at today is more interesting in that the list of symbols we have, when used in conjunction with the rules we've got, or the numbers when used in conjunction with the arithmetic that we have set up, behaves in a way that makes the symbols take on a meaning in English. But to make sure we really understand that as thoroughly as possible, I'm going to, rather than explaining it all right away, let's figure out what it means as we see the rules. Last time we began by taking a look at what constitutes well-formed strings, and this time will be no different. First we have the atoms, which are three or four of the symbols really. P, Q, and R. Those are well-formed strings. And if you put these little tick marks, uh, I'll probably be referring to them as primes from here on. That also counts as an atom, and therefore it counts as a well-formed string. And we're starting with the rules a little early this time. The way to define well-formed strings involves several rules. Here we're going to assume that X and Y are either atoms, or atoms that have already undergone these rules any iteration of times. If you have a well-formed string, and you put this squiggly mark, which we'll call a tilde in front of, that is still a well-formed string. If you have two well-formed strings, X and Y, you can put any of these three symbols in between the two and start and finish them with these little organizational markers. Those are also well-formed strings. And just to take a look at how complicated well-formed strings can be or don't necessarily have to be, here's a few examples. To start off with Q quadruple prime, we're using the first rule which we'll remember was adding a tilde to the beginning. So we have the tilde, and we have the thing we already had, and we're adding another atom. And to it, we're using rule number one three times. And now you'll remember that all the rest of the rules involved these organizational markers, two of the well-formed strings we already have, and a symbol in the middle. So here we see that this is the well-formed string we just formed, and then this here is the well-formed string that we made up here. After that we're introducing another atom, and this may look a little more complicated, but you see the organizational things at the end. You see this symbol, which you know goes in between two well-formed strings. We have the atom we just introduced, and we have this whole thing, which still includes those organizational symbols. And if you read, it's just what we arrived at right here. And lastly, just to make things a little more complicated looking, you'll see that this section right here is nothing more than what we just arrived at there. And we have another one of those three symbols we can put. And then I've taken a random well-formed string, the one we had right there, and bound them together using the organizational marks. But you'll remember from last time that well-formed strings aren't what we're going for, we're going for theorems. And last time we had an axiom to start with, though this time we don't. And you know we're going to be applying rules to the axioms in order to get theorems. But then how does it make sense that we could arrive at theorems without starting at an axiom? As it turns out, our fantasy rule here is going to be able to create theorems without starting with any sort of axiom, just by how it works. We're going to use a pretty simple example. Usually the fantasy rule you'll want to use in conjunction with at least one other rule. So rather than introducing the entire list of rules, I'll just introduce the one that we need in order to make the fantasy rule seem more intelligible. The rule we're going to be using is the double tilt rule. This string, two tildes in a row, you can either add it to a well-formed string, as long as the resulting string is well-formed, or you can delete it from 
a well-formed string. And just to keep in mind, these things are going to have meanings in English. It's not just a random assortment of rules like it was for our last system. And what kind of word in English behaves the way the tilde is behaving here? It's just a good way to understand that the symbols are not meaningful. The rules give the symbols meaning based on how they behave in the system. That being said, we're going to start working on the fantasy rule. You start off by making a line that is just that symbol, and we're going to call this a push into fantasy. Once you've pushed into a fantasy, you are allowed a premise. That means that while we are under this heading, we are going to regard this as a theorem. And we only know one rule that we can do to theorems in order to produce another theorem. Certainly, if this premise was indeed an axiom, we could use our rule and derive at this as a theorem. Then we have the bracket closing, and we'll call that a pop out of the fantasy. But what good is having fantasy theorems if you can't get a real one out of it? And this is the real theorem. What we have, you do the organizational mark, you put your premise, then you do this sideways U symbol, and then any result you have, doesn't matter if we've used a whole bunch of rules, you can use any of those, put it after that U, and then close it off. Now what do we think this means in English? The fantasy rule gives this symbol certain behaviors, and they act very similarly to a concept in English that you are probably familiar with. And we really can't forget that instead of these symbols, the numbers that we've arbitrarily chosen, really I chose these arbitrarily. Some of them are the same as in um, Gerd L. Asher Buck, some of them I had to add on my own, that's okay. It doesn't matter which numbers you choose. It matters what the rules are, just like it doesn't matter which symbols you choose, it matters what the rules do to those symbols. Alright, let's start in on all of the rules. There's quite a few more than the last time, but you'll see that most of them are not so hard, especially once we've figured out the symbol's meaning in English. The first we have is the joining rule, which you will remember from rules about well-formed strings. If x and y are theorems, then x and that symbol, then y, is also a theorem. Separation rule is just the opposite. If we have the x, that symbol, and y within those nice little organizational markers, then both x and y are theorems. We also have our double-tilled rule that we talked about earlier. And just to make sure we understand the double-tilled rule here, um, I've used it improperly. You'll probably be able to see that where I have inserted them. We needed to have a well-formed string. This by itself is not a well-formed string, so you cannot put the two tilds in front of that. This is a well-formed string, this is a well-formed string, or this whole thing is a well-formed string. So if you had put them at the beginning here, right in front of the P, or right in front of the Q, those would have all been valid, but this is not valid. Moving on, we have our fantasy rule, which we just talked about, and our carryover rule, which will be the last one we discuss before moving on to another example and explaining what this actually is going to mean. It states that inside a fantasy, any theorem from a lesser fantasy can be invoked. To make sense of that, let's look at another example. It will probably be nice to see some of these other rules in action as well. So we're starting with the beginning brackets, which we know is a push into a fantasy. Here again, we're going to be using P as the premise, so within this set of brackets, P is officially a theorem, but only until this bracket ends. Then we're going to push again. There's nothing wrong with being in a fantasy, and then going into another one. 
And inside this fantasy, we are going to use Q as our new premise. Now the carryover rule says that we can bring P, which is our premise from this fantasy, into this deeper fantasy. And then we're going to use the joining rule. We have Q and we have P, so we're going to put them together using this mark. Now these brackets indicate that we're going to be leaving this first fantasy. So we have our premise from this fantasy, we have this symbol, and our result was this using the joining rule. So we can see that this is our real theorem that we gained from this fantasy. Though, because we are still in a fantasy, we can't say it is a true theorem because this is still using the P here as a premise. So in order to get our real theorem, we have to pop back out of that fantasy. We use our premise, which for this fantasy was the P, this symbol, and then all of this here is the result we arrived at right here. Probably most people by now have gained a sort of understanding just based on how the symbols work, um, kind of what they are going to mean. The atoms are going to be statements, so P could mean this is written in Sharpie. We could have Q mean this is written on graph paper. And this symbol here, we probably figured out that it works isometrically with the word and. And then this sideways u means either implies or it works as an if then. You just have to say the if before you get to the symbol. Here we're saying if q then p and q. And then down at the bottom here our real theorem is if p then if q <laughs> then p and q. Um, less clunkly in English, then we would probably say if we assume P and Q, we have P and Q. And in our last video, we probably showed just how long and tedious figuring out what the arithmetic rules governing these numbers would be in order to match isomorphically the rules that we have as we have figured them out. We're not going to actually worry too much about what these rules are only using arithmetic because that would be very, very time consuming. If you have a free weekend, go ahead and try, but I urge you to remember that it is likely going to take a very long time. What we have here is nothing more than the same derivation that we just did. It's probably a little bit harder to read in numbers, but that's fine. We don't need to use numbers, but it is very, very important to remember that numbers, you don't just translate the numbers to symbols and the symbols to English. You can just translate the numbers directly into English. Now back to the rules. And if you haven't figured it by now, the tilde means not. We've got the rule of detachment. So if we have x and we have if x then y, well, what do you think we have? Let's say x is this is written in Sharpie. And let's say y is this is written on graph paper. So the statement here is if we have this is written in Sharpie, and we have if this is written in Sharpie, then this is written on graph paper, then we have this is written on graph paper. Next one is called the contrapositive rule. What we have is if x then y and not y means not x. These two are interchangeable. De Morgan's rule we have not x and not y and not x or y are interchangeable. That makes sense. And then we have x or y means if not x then y. And lastly, you'll certainly notice that I never explained that this V here means OR, but I think it was pretty self-evident. Now we're going to take a look at a considerably longer example. So here we have two statements. There's only two that will be invoked in this whole thing, so let's define what they are. I work in customer service full-time, so that tends to be what 
occupies my mind. Let's have statement P mean I am rude to a customer. And we'll have statement Q mean a customer complains. What we are using for our premise here is if I am rude to a customer, then a customer complains. And if I am not rude to a customer, a customer complains. You're totally allowed to disagree with a premise, but that is not the important part right here. The important is what we can say based on this premise. The first thing we're going to do is use the separation rule and take the and and just parse out this first part of it and use it as its own line. So we have, if I am rude to a customer, then the com customer complains. What we're going to do to this is use the contrapositive rule, which said that x implies y and not y implies not x. So using the contrapositive rule, we see that if a customer did not complain, it implies I was not rude to a customer. So after we use the contrapositive rule, we're going to use the separation and separate out the other half that came after the and. and then if we use the contrapositive rule on this other statement, what we have is if customers have not complained, then I have not not been rude to the customers. And then from here we're going to push into another fantasy. And you've probably noticed that not Q implies two different things, and so we're using as a premise not Q and seeing what we can get from there. We have not Q, we're gonna carry over the not Q implies not P, which we had up here, and using the detachment rule, we can say, since we have not Q, and we have if not Q, then not P, we have not P. And likewise, we're going to carry over the other part that we had, if not Q, then not not P. And we have not Q, we have not Q implies not not P, so we have not not P. Then we're going to join these two not p, which we have right here, and not not p, which we have right there. If we use the De Morgan rule on this statement, what we have instead is we take the tilde, or we take one tilde from each side, and we change the and to an or, put the tildes in front, and we have not p or not p. And now we're going to pop out of that fantasy, and what did we learn from this? Our premise was not q, so if we assume not Q, then what did we get? Not Q means that neither P nor not P. Now we're going to take this statement and use the contrapositive rule, which is going to say P or not P implies Q. We're going to push into yet another fantasy, use not P as a premise, and we don't need to do anything premise implies the premise. We can use the switcher rule rule right here and say P or not P. It means that we have if P or not P then Q and we have P or not P so we can just detach the Q since we have both of those statements and then we can pop out. And finally what we've arrived at is this premise we originally had implies Q. Or translated back into English, we have if I am rude to customers, then they complain, and if I am not rude to customers, they complain implies that customers complain. Perhaps a lot of work at something that sounds absolutely obvious, but that's no matter. Now we're going to be able to very briefly talk a little bit about the work that Kurt Gerdell actually was doing. Let's just have a little fun, and I'm going to just add another atom, G, which represents a very specific statement. And that statement will be, this statement is not a theorem. It sounds kind of tricky, doesn't it? Unfortunately, if all we have is that to work with, we can make such interesting things as either this statement is not a theorem, or this statement is not not a theorem. So there's not a whole lot we can do with that yet, but it's an interesting thing to start thinking about. Those are the kinds of things we will be taking a much more in-depth look in the next video. I hope to see you there. Thank you very much.